is Professor Li Zhao Duang. Um, the firm is Atelier and it's based in Beijing. Focused on small, often self-initiated projects, uh, Li Zhao Duang uh, develops propositions about an appropriate Chinese architecture that brings together traditional and contemporary modes of expression, technical knowledge, and artistic judgment. His architecture combines a spiritual exploration of ideas with rational thinking and is based on a continuing inquiry into the underlying concepts of space in the Chinese context. He graduated from the School of Architecture at Tsinghua University in 1984 and later went on to do his PhD at the School of Architecture, Delft University of Technology between 1989 to 1993. He is a practicing architect, educator, and researcher on architecture. Lee's design work ranges from interior architecture to urban spaces. His built projects are few because his dedication to the project requires enormous devotion. And this devotion has led him to win both national and international awards, such as winner of AR for Emerging Architecture Award in 2009, for his design for Bridge School in Fujian province, and the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2010 for the same project. He was also awarded the Honorary Fellowship by the AIA. He is currently the Professor Chair of the Architecture Program at the School of Architecture, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Professor, all yours. Uh, I noticed that the majority of the audience are professionals. So I will present myself as a teacher, not a professional architect. Because the, uh, normally, uh, my full-time job is teaching at the university. So, design is a kind of an amateur work, part-time. So, uh, I'm in a win-win position. Whatever I do wrong, you can forgive me. All right? Where is the... Uh, Can I, can I control the, uh... oh, okay, 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 sorry. It doesn't work. Be here uh, to share my process of learning architecture. I, I, I can't say I can teach something, but rather I, after 20 years, in the academia, I started to practice architecture in year 2002. So I only have 20 years practice, uh, a very small number of projects to share. But each one of them uh, is a kind of a, I pick up the clients. And in the first stage of my uh, practice, I am the clients myself. I do this, the sponsor the project, I do the design, get a building built. So that's in the first 10 years, between 2002 and 2012. And then, uh, why I don't have these slides? Finally. So you see, I put my title as a professor, not an architect. All right. Uh, a reflexive regionalist practice. This is uh, the uh, uh, theoretical perspective I'm trying to project as my basis. I don't see the move. I see here, but not, no. Did this work? Oh, this painting is from uh, Song Dynasty, 1,500 years ago. So looking China from distance in terms of time, we had a very uh, unique culture. And uh, stuck. Yeah, from the same period of time. You see the, uh, the proportion, the details, and also the way it is presented is a very 
subtle and detailed. And 500 years ago, we almost have the uh, impressionist uh, artwork. And looking at China from distance in terms of space, China tried to present itself as a modern uh, society very eagerly. But when we look at China from close distance, it could happen like this because lack of reflection on reality, on the problems we're having. And so uh, I'll try to briefly introduce a little bit about my backgrounds uh, on China and uh, also about my academic uh, work before the practice. And his name is Liang Qichao. He's the, probably the first Chinese who realized that China is simply another culture. He studied in Japan and uh, in, in early uh, 19th century. When he looked at the J China from Japan, he suddenly realized, okay, China is simply another culture. Before him, every Chinese believe we are the center of the universe. That's what they call the central kingdom, Zhongguo, right? So he started to try to reform when he came back to China, and uh, he failed. So, and then 1949, we established New China. And uh, New China is supposed to have a new identity. And established its new identity took years, from 1949 to 76. And along those years, many things happened, but nothing really interesting happened. And after 20 years, you know no cultural revolution, right? After 10 years turmoil, this messy, crazy uh, event, not, not event, I don't know what words should I use. China is like an old patient getting very sick. And recover takes time, takes energy. Uh, I went to school to study architecture in the year 1979. And year 1980, we saw this exhibition, the New Star Oil Painting Exhibition. And one of those paintings struck everyone. So this is the one of them. The real size of this is about two meter by 1.5 meter. And uh, reality is projected 20 times more. Before this one, no reality is projected as real. So this one is really, it's like a Chinese culture or Chinese society is start, Chinese art start ground, from ground zero. And then we start to reform. 1980s. What to do? We don't know. Political issues not important anymore. So let's not talk about politics anymore. And uh, we have start to have TV, but there's no program. And we start to transform our city. We don't know how. So demolishing, deconstruct, probably the terms to describe what happens in the 1980s, in the 1990s. Everywhere, construction site or deconstruction site. So what we do is we invited uh, American Chinese architects, I and Pei, to design something for us to showcase what is supposed to be um, contemporary modern Chinese architecture, because we haven't done anything since the uh, you know the before Cultural Revolution and afterwards. And Pei designed a hotel in this, and he presented this one in a very Chinese way to the government. And then uh, the government was very disappointed in the very beginning because they were expecting Ch uh, Pei to design something modern and Chinese at the same time. And Pei says, okay, before you know what is modern, you have to know who are you first, right? We were very lost in the, in the 80s. You know, even the Chinese character cannot be input onto the computer. So we even, we even uh, got this idea, forget about the Chinese. We use pinyin, you know, the, the, the Latin uh, words. We, we experienced that uh, very sadly. And then the government said, okay, maybe you are right. So let's see who we are first in terms of identity. And then 20 years, practice after Pace Frequent Hill Hotel. We practice like this. this. This project actually I joined also partially as a supervisor on site. 
This is another project by uh, Professor Wu Liangyong in our school in Beijing. So white wall, peach roof, this very vernacular settlements representing China, you know, all over China. Architecture practice is like this. Small building, large building, but China is a huge country. One day, in 1985, I think, the mayor of Paris came over to China to visit Beijing, and he told the mayor of Beijing, says, the two most beautiful cities in the world, one is Paris, and one is Beijing. And then uh, the mayor of uh, Beijing, very curious, why you say so? He says the most beautiful part of Beijing is like the big roof. Okay, then the mayor of Beijing ordered all the public buildings has to be kept with the big roof. So design, supposed to be a matter of debate, now become a matter of choice. Yeah? And uh, this is a 2007, we selected online the top 10 most ugly buildings in China. <laughs> this is the hotel, can you imagine that? <laughs> Everything is about pictures, it's about iconic, recognizable. Because, you know, people, when you are, you know, I remember very clearly when I was in school, uh, we were exposed of references. Everything is from overseas on the magazines. All the publications from overseas. They are in the period of postmodern structuralism, all the isms, right? We have been through the modernism yet. So what do we do? We copy and we follow. And then uh, the postmodern thing is the most easy one to follow because they talk about icon, right? Contextualism and things like that. Okay, contextualism, I can't. So uh, after that, I think year 2000, the young architect trained from overseas came back to China. And then when they saw the uh, practice, they were very sad. Okay, let's not do anything with Chinese culture. Let's do directly, wholeheartedly embrace the modern architecture from the West. Okay, they start to do things like this. But can you tell this, where is this? This can be in anywhere. It can be in Berlin, in Austria, in, in America, right? And when suddenly young architects aged less than 30 got an opportunity to design something like a half a million square meters, what do you do? You give everything you have, right? In terms of color, in terms of form, shape. Overstatement is probably the words to describe what has happened in that period of practice in China. So actually it's, it's the tiny boxes at the bottom, but it looks much larger because you are not, we are not confident. That's why I have to you know, make it look bigger. This is the city hall of Shenzhen, and the, the boxes are the real size of the volume of the building. But then you need a big roof to make it look powerful and strong. Okay, well, Kuhas came over to China, Right away, he noticed that what you need. You need something strange. You need something overstated, right? But he knows how to do things less kitschy, yeah? So he did this one, the CCTV building. But you know the problem of this building, right? It's slanted. For high-rise building, the vertical transportation is the most important thing. For this one, you have to change your lift every now and then, yeah? And cost twice as much as the same amount of uh, volumes like uh, the Halifa Tower, the tallest building, cost only half of this building, the same square meters. And you all know this. So all those projects are done uh, before 2008. So as I, I said just now, before 2008, uh, many things happened, but nothing much happened. Okay, so that's my proposition. Uh, identity creative thinking, and the fourth ecology. I think the, the identity and creative thinking, everyone knows what it's all about, right? So I will touch a little bit on that. And then the fourth ecology is a paper I wrote uh, last year. Uh, it's about something uh, I think is important for us to, to, to practice now. So in the middle is what I call my, myself, reflexive regional uh, practice. I think creative thinking is the way you look at things from different angles, and also look things 
that is beyond. For instance, this boat. And normally people say, okay, this boat is made of carbon or steel or timber. And then the shape is like this. From the engineer point of view, this is the best shape for aerodynamics or whatever reasons, right? But we very seldom just say, okay, what the boat bring us through the experience of this and this and that. So this is something beyond the object itself, right? We all know this shape, the most commonly seen geometry in nature, but we seldomly ask questions. Why in nature we have this shape, not square, cube, or triangular forms, but this, yeah? All the planets in the universe is shaped like this. And the grapes, the fruits, also shaped like this. Why is that? You know, if you see things beyond this one, we know there's reason behind the forms, right? So what is in common between the, the, the planets, the stars, and the grapes is you need to protect the contents by the most efficient way. So smallest the surface, largest volume is this globe shape, right? So that's why the whole universe is full of geometries like this. And we understand right away the leaves, because the solar energy, to absorb the solar energy from the sun, you need to have the most efficient surfaces. That's why the smallest surface, the volume but larger surfaces, is the most efficient way to get the energy. And I, I give two examples uh, from, uh, from the uh, uh, the real projects. This is a, a project in the uh, Waterloo Station in London, and is in the center of a roundabout. Before this building was built, it was a, a very busy roundabout, and all the buildings in the neighborhoods are very bored. You know, it's a uh, you know, punctured windows from the 1950s, 60s, no color, and no interesting forms, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the roundabout is very efficient in terms of traffic when there's no pedestrians, right? But it's very unfriendly for the pedestrian to walk around. So the architect took the job and then started a very creatively an idea that did a sunken space for the pedestrian and then did a form that is very unique in this neighborhood, that is a circular shape, and then totally glazed and then very colorful. So everything comes together. He made this negative space a positive star to turn everything around. You see, when you are here, you don't feel you are in a busy traffic. Another example is, I don't know the designer's uh, name. It's uh, the French pavilion, uh, I think in Hamburg, uh, World Expo. When you see this sketch, Mission Impossible, right? Four pillars and then a plate like that. But it was built. If you see section, you understand how. It's like this. You don't see this angle when it's finished, right? So that's the way you look at things from different perspectives, different angles. Okay, identity we all know. I think uh, my, my peers from Vietnam talked very clearly about the, uh, what is identity all about. So I will briefly go through. So every culture has its own identity, has its own way of thinking, has its own way of doing architecture. And uh, I think as an architect, everyone knows who did these drawings, right? Frank Lloyd Wright. But very few people know that Frank Lloyd Wright was the first Western modern architect who used bird's eye view to represent his design work. Do you know that? He's the first one. Because before him, according to Western philosophy, there's a subject, there's an object. The subject, which is a human beings. Look at the, the object from perspectives, right? From human eyesight. That's why all the Western drawings in history is presented from a perspective. You check out all the drawings, all the images. But in the East, I noticed in India you also have this. We, we, well, I mean, for, for China, we don't distinguish 
what is subject, what is object. The human beings are part of nature. We have a saying that the, the Tian Ren He Yi, the human beings are part of nature, they are together with heaven and earth. Right? So all the perspectives are done from the bird's eye view. In traditional Chinese paintings, they're all done in this way. And by doing this way, you see things beyond things. You see the building behind the building. You see the mountain behind the mountains. So you can present an image of a city street in one scroll. This is, this is like 11 meters long, but this uh, height. One painting can show the, can show the whole city. It's because the multiple vanishing points and also because the bird's eye view perspectives. And then, this is Chinese garden, uh, which is very interesting. I will show you uh, a very interesting story. So we have all the elements here, the, the building, the rocks, the water, and also the trees. And uh, this is the Chinese character about a garden. We have enclosure, which is the wall, which is the boundary. And inside of which you have the earth, you have the water, you have the tree, right? So this is Chinese character, garden. And the most important uh, element in the Chinese garden is this corridor. It's a very elongated corridor. It never goes straight. You always turn around at a particular angle. When you turn around, you see different wheels, yeah? And interesting why, huh? But our neighbor, Japanese garden, is like you sit there tight and look the front, the view, whatever view it is. You don't, you don't move around. So it's our neighbor. And Japanese culture adopted Chinese culture from Tang Dynasty onwards. The architecture looks similar. But garden is different. Why is that? You see, in China, the most typical landscape is this, Yellow Mountain. So we got our inspiration from natural environments. And this Yellow Mountain, you look at from afar, and the close distance, that's different. And looking at different seasons, they're different. In different period of time, it looks different. So you need a dynamic process of going through the whole mountain to get a clue of what this mountain is all about. But in Japan, all the mountains look like this. The most representative landscape is the Fuji Mountain. And in Japan, you know, the old mountains are volcanoes, right? Volcano all shaped like this. So you don't need to go through the whole process to understand this mountain. Looking from Tokyo is like this, and at the foot of the mountain, you look like this too. So we are inspired by natural environment. That's why we learn from nature, from our culture, to get our identity. Yeah? And uh, okay, I give you another example, Singapore. I have two peers coming from Singapore. You are more familiar with than me, yeah? Okay. Singapore is the young, young nation state, younger than me, 1965, that was constructed, uh, funded. And then in the very beginning of uh, the funding, the, uh, they, they did a, a sculpture there, the marine line. Uh, okay, all the Chinese are the daughter and sons of the dragon, right? So all the Singaporeans are daughter and sons of the marine line. You need a legend to identify yourself with the country. Because when the Singapore was funded, there was no original Singaporeans. It was jungle island. There's no people there, no culture there. So people are, all the immigrants from, from China, from Malay, from India, from other countries as well. So you need to somehow forget about your original, uh, wherever you're from, but establish a new nation state and everyone identify yourself with it. So they, they did this sculpture, but which is not enough, of course. You have to design your buildings, your build your cities, right? They don't know how. So they invited international renowned architects from all over the world. You have Ken Kotangi, you have Ian Pei, Sterling, and so on and so forth. Those skylines are done in the 1980s, all by those international renowned architects. But then one day, when Singaporean coming back from overseas to see this island, see the skylines. It's, they feel like it's like a, a mirage floating there because all those buildings has nothing to do with Singapore. Okay, sorry. 
The designers design those buildings the same way they design in their home country. Yeah? High-rise buildings or enclosed air conditioning and so on and so forth. Has nothing to do with the tropical island. Okay, now there's an important debate, the what we call post-colonial uh, turn. Uh, we know that the most important thing uh, about a post-colonial period is that before there was a center, and that's a periphery. The center are the colonizer. The peripheries are colonized, right? And uh, after independence, there's strong desire to reestablish identity on its own. But there's always the issue about the center and periphery. What is center? The center is the uh, because it wants technology, they have contemporary lifestyle, so they have ideas. So the periphery tried to copy that ideas and try to become the center themselves. But the problem is, by copy around, you never become the center. So the Singaporean architects start to reflect, to think about what is tropical lifestyles and what is supposed to be the way you do with your buildings. Okay, actually very simple. Cross ventilation, sun shading, and rainwater, avoid from the rainwater. Then they start to design building like this, and like this. A detailed design, uh, Woha designed this one, one the uh, Aka Khan in 2007. So that during the monsoon uh, season, the wind can go through, but not the rain. And let's start with design like this. And uh, the townhouse, a very unique townhouse, one of the kind. Everything is porous, everything going through. There's no clear cut inside, outside, or floor to floor. Light can penetrate through, but not direct sunlight. What here, you know, is uh, when you're taking a shower, it doesn't matter rain or, or not rain, right? So they don't, need, they don't need the roof. So when you're clear with your situation, design becomes a very direct and uh, straightforward, debatable question to answer. Another example is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is like, uh, you don't need architect because they have only a small piece of land. Okay, you have this piece of land and you pile up with the standardized forms, that's it. So it's like the dim sum. Standardization, but allows variety, which I think is very creative, very efficient, and very easy to construct. You don't have a beach, that's why you have to somehow come up with fresh ideas and multi-programmatic things probably happen in one space. Okay, now third proposition, uh, what I call the false ecology, uh, is about the future. We, are des we design for the future, right? So every piece of work we design is uh, yeah, realized after one year, two years, three years, sometimes 10 years. Then we have to think ahead. But thinking ahead, it's not that we project our mentality or our thinking now onto the future, but rather staying in the position of the future and looking back now, identify the questions, the problems that we're having now. And then you do design based on that. The first industrialization really uh, make a major through in our humanity, right? And uh, Le Gobuzier, when he observed the developments of technology, he started to think and vision a new architecture supposed to be there. This new architecture is based on the, the solving a problem of reality of the pro, uh, program, new material and new technology, and the new mechanics. He's a very visionary architect, and uh, this is his vision, almost like uh, 80, no, 100 years ago, and which is actually realized in Singapore after half a century. 
later. OK, last century is a very busy uh, century. Architect tried a lot in coming up, inventing all kind of forms, right? Very colorful, very beautiful, things like that. I don't go to detail about this. Uh, we also come to this stage. Very few people ask questions. What happened after 100 years? This is a new phenomenon for new our contemporary world, right? Starting from Chicago, high-rise buildings, and then getting very busy because the, uh, the so-called CBD is very busy, very expensive. That's why you have to go high. But the lifespan of every building is limited to 100, 200 years. What happened after all those buildings reached the end of their lifespan? You know, when we are in the, we, we, we used to live here, I think that's right. You can last forever because demolishing those buildings or maintain those buildings is very easy. Okay? But what with this? We used to have this. But what do we, what do, we do with these buildings? How do you demolish those buildings side by side? They are not just concrete, they're steel. Yeah? We are reaching that period of time now. Because the, in New York, in Chicago, their high-rise building is 100 years old already. But we are still doing it. Yeah? OK, now we are at the second stage. Uh, last year, I think we all saw this progress in technology. The chat GPT changed almost everything. Everyone is kind of a, wow, we are entering a different uh, age now. Uh, different from the first industry, industrial revolution, the second one, this, this chat GPT thing really pushed forward so much that they can learn and evolve on their own, emerging, that can totally be beyond our control, right? And we also saw this uh, from the very beginning of the invention of the telephone until recent thing, is going through a process of dematerialization because the IT, because digital, because information, and so on and so forth. So our phone, it doesn't matter which brand, they look similar, right? Because everything, the most important thing is the surfaces, it's not the form. OK, but we're still doing buildings in terms of form making. Is that correct? And for me, this is the end of last century, not the beginning of this century. Well, this image is big, but I, I like to use this image. You know, this yellow, well, not the red colored planet, is the largest planet we could see, human being can see, from the universe. We can identify. And that yellow spot is our sun. And our Earth, you don't find it because it's too tiny. So why, why I show this one? We are nowhere. We are nobody. We are just dust, you know? But somehow, let me see this. This is the different stages of uh, geological age of our planet in terms of epoch. They, they talk about era and things like that, right? We are on the top now, starting from uh, how many years ago? Uh, thousands of years ago, probably. Huh? Before that one, is everything is about nature. It's about different other species. But when human beings settled down on this earth, we started a new era, what we call Anthropocene. And every, every era is ending somewhere. They have their lifespan. We have ours too. Technology, somehow, for the last 200 years, improved our lifestyle, it elongated our lifespan from 30 years old to 80 years old. But it's on the cost of exploration of a natural resource, and which caused the problems of environment, which also reduced the total lifespan of Anthropocene. Our humanity is getting shorter in terms of lifespan. So then we have to be careful about this. What about next generation, the next generations? Uh, OK, the, the one before human settlement is what we call first ecology, that is marine ecology. 
and the land ecology we call the second ecology, and the third ecology is Anthropocene, as we are doing uh, for thousands of years for our civilization to build our human settlements, right? And our footprint is all over the planet. And uh, this is what we're doing. So is it a, just an event or is the whole epoch? Uh, our human settlement, I mean, uh, all the human settlement, doesn't matter what, whatever culture it is, is about boundaries. You know, it's about, on the street is about boundary, the wall is about boundary, inside out of the building is about boundary. Inside our mind is all kind of boundaries because the human being's character, you know, desire for possession of more, right? So we see, doesn't matter what shape it is. All the maps in the past and now, you see those lines, right? Extreme case, the Lion City. Everything is enclosed in the artificial created environments. But is this future we want? This is what's called a false ecology. The three points, one is the broke boundaries, absorption and linkage, blend and symbiosis. So in four, uh, I try to update the third ecology, something different from the purely artificial. We want to have something engaged more with natural environments, be friendly with our natural resource. So the third ecology now is like a half, half. The first half we have done enough damage. The second half, can we repair and you know, do something about it? So my perspective, finally, I go to my practice, which is an amateur job, my part-time job. And the first one, uh, 2002, by that time, the first uh, 10 years, between 2012 to 2012, the first 10 years, my practice are based in the countryside. And uh, uh, the character or, or the, uh, if I use one word, keywords to describe those projects, they are all illegal because we don't ask approval from the government. And uh, there's some, oh, I will show a little, probably have seen this, some of this. This is the school, a little school project uh, in Yunnan province. I funded the project and I could get a building design that built for the local uh, community. So everything is about local construction, local conditions, climatic, culture, and lifestyle, and the way of construction. The second one, in the same village, uh, this is my first client, actually. He looked at that project. He thought, okay, maybe you, you can uh, do me a favor, design something. That's my first client. And he came to work for me in Singapore. I was teaching in Singapore by, then, by that time. And then we went out to look at, for the site. This is the site. And I was very scared in a huge, uh, wild, natural setting. And the mountain behind, we call it Yulong Xuezhan, the Jade Mountain, Snow Mountain, 5,500 meters above sea level. Very young, energetic, you know, it's very powerful when it's strong. And to design the, a, a building here is difficult. For me, it's very difficult because we believe that the best energetic uh, environment is the, supposed to be the balance between the yin and the yang, right? But here is too much yang energy. And what we do is we, we learn from history, from our own culture. And we have this kind of a history that you, you don't do a building there, but you, you plan it together with natural setting. It's, it's whole, about the whole environment. So water is, belongs to in energy. An enclosure is in energy. So then what I did is the, uh, I give us big surfaces of water, which comes from the snow mountain and then a courtyard, but not closed courtyard. That courtyard can really breathe, can really open up. And uh, every room can have a view towards the mountain, 
can have the view towards the water. This is 2008. All the materials coming from the neighborhoods, except the steel. Majority of the materials like the stone, the timber, and the water, snow water. So you are making uh, a series of, uh, uh, you're going through the process of experiencing the whole process, like uh, going through the stage, and you're, when you surface, you see this very calm, uh, I don't like decorations whatsoever, so the building is supposed to be about the space. You know, I, li I like the uh, topical space, your name of your office, it's about space. Yeah, we have a saying from Lao Tzu, what is contained is more important than the container. So container is something that just a tool for the contained. So that's why it's very simple. It's all follow the, uh, the local uh, way of construction. All the details are technical details. There's no decorative details. And the building is supposed to be blend with that natural setting not detached from it. Uh, this is my own house, but it's not finished. Uh, in another location near uh, Jiangxi province, which is very, the humidity is very high, and is a jungle. That's why the building is kind of lifted up instead of landing there. So in energy is very powerful here. So that's why I raised it up. Uh, this is the school bridge project in the Fujian province, uh, which is about the test that I'm having by that time about how Chinese theories in medicine can be transformed into an architectural solution. So in this case, whether the intervention of an architectural uh, program can rejuvenate the community. I still have time, though. Yeah? OK. I need to control. There's a lot of slides. I want to, to, to show more. So this is the mock-up for the school bridge. So it's about connection. It's about channeling through of energies. A very simple structure. But it has nothing to do with the local style of construction, but rather it's a new animal. But the, the points of the animal is trying to bring new energy. We call it a defamiliarized uh, energy to rejuvenate the, uh, the community. It's a big, it's a, it's a two, only two class. It's also a playground for the kids after school. And there are two uh, stage for the uh, puppy show. The kids are very happy after the building was built. It's a, it's a very remote village, but after the construction of the, the project, the, a lot of visitors, so the kids never got the chance to see outside world, but now they have a, almost like a window. Uh, that's a little library I did uh, something like 12 years ago in Beijing. Again, a very remote, uh, poor village. And the most uh, impressive texture I find when I visit the, the village is those twigs. They use this to burn, uh, to cook, and also to heat up their house in winter. So I thought maybe this could be the material for this little library, not just for decoration, not for decoration, but for the, I will show the, the function of the twigs. is to provide the sun shading thing. Because for a library, you need control of lighting coming through into the space. No furniture whatsoever, everything's together. Structure, architecture, interior space, and furnitures are one piece. This is how it works. Uh, I need to solve the problem of winter and summer in terms of air conditioning. We don't have power supply. So what we have to do it according to our design. 
and based on the concept of design according about the technology, we solve the problems of ventilation and air conditioning. So the, the, in summertime, the surface temperature over the water is much lower. And then it was it's supposed to go through from this opening and absorbed by the hot water from the top of the space into the space and get out of them here. So actually we tested the temperature inside is five degrees lower than outdoor temperature. I mean, and under the sunshine. That's how it works. And in winter is another way around. You trap in the heat and then get into the inner space. We didn't do anything on the surfaces, no treatment whatsoever. So the plants can grow and the birds can find their nest. So the idea is the, uh, the building one day will become part of nature into the natural evolution process. Because for me anyway, you, the lifespan of a building has a limit. Why bother to have so many busy things happen here, right? So after, let's say 20 years or 30 years from now, the building is not in use anymore. We just demolish everything. There's no footprint of human settlement whatsoever. And uh, because it's a, it's a charity work, we don't have the budget for everything. So the books are actually contributed by the, the, the community from, from the city. So you are invited to contribute three books, and you can take one book away from the, the, uh, the other collections. So it's become a platform for social exchange of ideas. And we did that in three months. We got all the collection of the books. Uh, okay, now is the second stage. Uh, I start to do buildings that are supposed to get approval from the government. Those are real projects. Uh, uh, but I don't want to go to details of this because I, I have another project which is, I think deserves more time. Uh, this is an extension of uh, our School of Architecture at Tsinghua University. The, uh, okay, briefly, just briefly. Like that. I want to put more time on this. This is a new building I finished during the pandemic. So we couldn't make it uh, 2020. And now I can show it now. Otherwise, I will show only the illegal buildings. But now it's legal buildings. I'm very happy about that, actually. Uh, 20,000 square meters site and the construction of 100,000 square meters school. Plural ratio 5. I mean, any architect knows it's almost a mission impossible. You need, you need fields, right? You need open places for the kids to run, up, run around. But for this one, no. Only such a small piece of land. So what I do, you have to, you know, for this kind of thing, every architect think about the first line. What you draw with the first line, right? Where your concept comes from. This one has to be the, the so poor source of your inspiration. And for me, uh, what do we call the Dao? You know, we, we, according to Lao Tzu, Dao Sheng Yi. So Dao created one and one created two. So the, the one I created here is from this, my understanding about the city, Shenzhen, which is uh, subtropical, uh, very crowded, high density, and uh, very hot in summer. Summer, summer. That, uh, very hot summer, and then this something like winter now, it's but not, not so, so cold. So the issue mostly is about uh, in what you do with summer, right? So this line is about, you know, I mentioned about the force ecology. I don't want to have so many boundaries inside your mind or physically in your buildings. So I try to design something that is so free for the students to move around in the campus. So I did the podium first, and then the blocks on top, and the open up spaces. 
That's the uh, lowest level, which is the, uh, the city level. Actually, the street, when you are in your street, you can see through. It's not a wall. There's no boundary between the city and the school. In intermediate level. And then the podium level. There are many holes for ventilation. And also more spaces. You, there's no open field, right? But here you see the sports facilities. All the sports facilities are divided into uh, 16 units. So at the same time, you can have 16 groups of students play around in the school. The running track is also in the, in the, in, in sky. The rooftop is also used for training or running. This is a section for the, between the two uh, class buildings. This is the finished image. On the top, actually, is a, is a bridge. It's also a library linking the two parts. And uh, on the top, you have this uh, football field. At the bottom, you have this volleyball, which, which is NBA level standard. Uh, indoor space and this building is actually on the right is the is the dormitory for for the for the teachers uh, that's the library it's also the both on both sides you have corridors linking the two two classrooms so the people on both sides can can walk around and all those locations of the bridges are supposed to provide the most efficient way of connection between the two buildings this is library The running track. So on this running track, you, you don't feel tired because every now and then you turn around. It's like Chinese garden. You see different things. Sometimes you see inside of campus, sometimes you see outside campus, the city life and thing, things like that. Uh, the image on the left is at the street of the city. So you, when you see the building, it's like uh, a three-dimensional park. You see through, you see the inside of campus, you see the kids running around on the, uh, on the uh, sky bridge running track. Sky gardens, so the students can colonize every small corner to create their own living and the study space. So the vertical greenery is not just a dec it's not decoration at all. It's a, it's a shading device to shade away the sunlight from the east and the west. And also it's a vertical ecological screen for the kids on the high rise. So every floor, you're coming out of your window, your door, you see the, the, you, you breathe the air coming through the greenery. And every single room is capable of cross-ventilation. And I also designed this sculpture to stimulate the students' auditoriums. The backdrop of this auditorium is, is, uh, is not solid wall, but it can be opened for cross-ventilation. That's a dormitory for the, the, the teachers. And there's all kind of public uh, open gardens uh, in, the, uh, in the dormitory, both for the students and also for teachers. This is looking from afar. How many times do I have now? Oh, go on, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I, I will show you uh, two, not finished, but a very interesting recent project I did during the, uh, the pandemic. Nothing to do, so doing it at home. Not constructed yet, but a very interesting one. This one is the, a small library uh, in Shanghai, which is after 12 years of my first library, I did another one. Uh, this is a different concept. This is more about, uh, the building itself is totally open. You are in the open air situation, but the books are kept in the shelves. So you're going here and they gradually you approach the building, 
it totally opened. You see this bridge over, but it's very low. It's about 1.5 meters. You either chose to go under it or enter the entrance from somewhere else. The material are recycled from the, uh, you know, the railway track, the bed. We recycle that material uh, and use it here. This is the floor plan. All the four sides, they are all open. The, the library in Beijing is uh, totally enclosed, right? But here is totally open. Another one in Yangzhou, center part, uh, center chi uh, China. This is a uh, downtown in the very center of an Asian city, which is very famous for private gardens. And so I designed a new garden adjacent to the two very famous uh, traditional gardens in the, in the neighborhood. But this one, I don't want anything to do with icons, no icons at, at all. But you feel it's the consequences, or you feel it's the, 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 uh, the, the Chinese garden in terms of spatial relationships, but not in form. Well, this city is very famous for canals. You know, we have a canal so linking uh, North China and the South China. So it's very famous for, for water. So in this case, uh, we have water as an element, but not as, the, as in terms of shape. And a very small piece of land, 100 meters by 30 meters. So 30, no, 3,000 square meters in terms of footprint. And then the square meters in terms of built area is only uh, uh, less than 1,000. But the point is, this is a public uh, living room in, in, the, in the form of a garden. Well, the material in this old uh, Asian city is mostly bricks and tiles. So in this case, on the outfit, I will use the same material. This is the uh, renovated neighbor buildings, which is part of our design. So. You know, you need defamiliarized objects to make the space, even though the space itself is very familiarized in terms of texture, right, in terms of form. But then you enter. It's very complicated in terms of plan. Huh? There's three levels, there are four levels actually, like two, two, building, uh, two levels above, sea le above the, uh, the ground, and then uh, basement, and the top of the second floor. So there's four levels you can move around. So even though it's a very short garden, but actually you can walk uh, two hours inside a garden. There's also a little library and a cafe. Well, you're walking on the top of the second floor. Every now and then you can walk outside the boundary to experience the city life as well. This is from the library. Actually, from, uh, you, when you, there are 100 people walking within the garden. You don't see each other because it's all hidden. This one is the one you sit there in the library to look at the view in front of you and also the building, the neighboring building, which is also part of the, the project. The dry garden. Every now and then you have a happy surprises. Okay, uh, last project. Uh, this is a, a museum, a dragon boat museum uh, in the water. This is also the, the only building I designed with a curved line. I don't like curve, you know. I don't like par par parametric design, things like that, because I think it's costly, yeah? But for this one, I think uh, curve line really matters because 
in the water, you don't do straight lines, otherwise too harsh. But for this one, I think I want to build up the tension. You know, when you, when you drive the, the, uh, the boat, you have this tension. Then for me, the curve line really can express this kind of a feeling. Uh, you see from the floor of the boat underneath, see from the far. I will end my presentation with this last image, which is the competition uh, uh, I did. Uh, it's really about dematerialized of architecture, but came back, contribute back for the community with a space that you can really share your, your community with our natural setting, even in the city uh, community. Thank you. Can we please uh, have Raghu from Simply Sofa come over? Uh, they have been consistently our sponsor for 11 years. Uh, please give him a big hand. Uh, request architect Sanjay Mohe to please come on stage. He's gone out. <laughs> All right. Uh, can we have uh, Navnath Kanade, please? I didn't count the time. Uh, okay. Please, please. Nice presentation. Thank you. So, Sorry. professor to professor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What is this? The mic. There's no time for a question. Let me just see. Um, do we have any questions? We limit it to three, please. Yeah. Hi. It was a lovely presentation. Lovely presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For all the works you have done and uh, we were able to see and my question is uh, about the library what is the floor material you have used which library old the first one the first one mm. the question is uh, what is the floor made what, what material uh, timber everything timber, is timber. Huh? the okay. structure is steel okay. everything else is timber and glass of course it's glass caged glass yeah I saw yeah. the glass so there is no uh, any incidents of any fire occurring because I saw wood everywhere and that too this is all no it's okay. hard wood okay yeah that is one for ten years already and we are okay. still okay. hang on there <laughs> okay I hope Se another ten years yeah thank you second thing is yeah. uh, you have a recent library. You yes. said if anybody is walking around, they'll not be able to see anyone. W what is the it's reason open. behind? It's open. It's totally open. No, then why they're not able to see anyone? The, the reason, what's oh, the, the concept garden. behind? The garden. Uh -huh. You mean the garden, right? Yeah. Because uh, for a small garden, you don't want to be crowded with other people. You, you want to enjoy the garden oh, yourself. Yes. There is a level difference also. Yeah, and yeah. that's why the level also difference. Um, uh, creates a, a kind of a curtain kind effect. Something right? like that, yes. Ah, okay. yeah. Then one more thing, college you uh, have used uh, the greens, right? Everywhere. Yes. How do they maintain, first thing? Secondly, it's very easy. We yeah. have the, uh, the irrigation system. 
collecting the rainwater and then uh, yeah it's, well, it, during the, the monsoon season you don't care about anything uh, then what about when the leaves all fall off how that's also a humongous job for cleaning cleaning we right? have, though you showed us all good no leaves stay there actually yeah the thank you stay there thank you so much thank you it was lovely thank you